I decided to do my preaching today from my office, which is O'Neill 312. And I'm sure people will be wondering why I didn't choose a chapel or some other sacred space. And I have to tell you, this office is where so much of my ministry at BC as a librarian and an educator has have taken place. I also want to throw in something about Sister Thea. I didn't have the opportunity to meet her in person, but lucky for me, between 1986 and 1989, I was a reference librarian at Xavier University in New Orleans, which is where the Institute of Black Catholics was held every summer. So I had the fortune to buy books for her classes and also to put books aside from the library collection. And that's one way that I really became connected with her. And then when I came to BC and I was working on College Road and I saw a building named after her, everything started coming back to me. When Sister Thea expressed her desire to join an all-white religious order against the caring warnings from her father, her answer was, I'm going to make them like me. I don't think she was going to beg the sisters to like her. I don't think. She was responding to that call from God to remind the world that we are all human. We are all children of God and we have no choice but to accept, respect, and treasure all human beings. Of course, we know that this is not the case. And we've seen how in the world some people don't even see the beauty of every God's child. We continue to live in a world, especially here in America, where people, because of the color of their skin, foolishly assume that they are better than others. Black lives matter. My life matters. And to make it clear to the world, I love who I am. I love the way God made me. I love my blackness. And if I wake up tomorrow and I look in the mirror and I've turned white, or some other color, please know that if you're on my emergency contact in my iPhone, you're going to have to call my primary care physician because this is a very, very serious emergency here. The scripture passage that I'm going to be using for my talk today is a very simple one, Genesis 1, chapter 27. God created man mankind in his image in the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. This takes me back to the message that Sister Thea's dad gave her when she decided to join an all-white uh, congregation. And when she said, I'm going to make them like me, I know she was going through a lot of difficulties. She had just converted to become Catholic. And from the readings that I did, Sister Thea was even told by an old nun that black people go to heaven with their nigger dogs and other animals. Even though this must have been very discouraging for her, she never ceased to appeal to the world. She appealed to the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops, asking the bishops to really make our universal church open to everyone. As an academic, she used her talent and her voice and so many different gifts that God has given her to bring the world together. As people of faith, we have an obligation through our words and especially the deeds that we are made in the image of God. I'm not a priest. I was never called to pre I never heard God calling me to priesthood. But I always remind, remind people that I was formed by the Brothers of the Holy Cross from Notre Dame. So 200 miles away from my hometown in Ghana, I went to high school for seven years and became so much imbued with so many gifts from the brothers who encouraged us to participate in the world as a way for us to change the world. So I'm going to Think about Sister Thea, her stories, her experience, and I'm going to use two stories to show how 
participation has helped me further God's uh, world of justice. The first thing I want to talk about is my involvement as in Malachi Parish in Burlington. St. Malachi is um, 99.9 .9 white Catholic church. One thing that a lot of people who know me know that I'm too lazy to go an hour away from where I live to go to church. So once I settle in a place, one of the things that I do is I find a church, could be a green church, a yellow church, or white church, and as a Catholic, I feel so comfortable at home. So this is how my conversion to St. Malachi started. I started going to Mass every Saturday, and I noticed that at the end of Mass, there were these four old ladies, old ladies in a good way, I'm not being condescending. They were the ones who were folding the parish bulletin. After the third Sunday, Saturday, and I don't know why I waited for three Saturdays, I decided I was going to join this club of bulletin folders. So I go to the conference room, I pull my chair next to them, and I noticed that they were so uncomfortable. I always think that they, maybe I just landed from another planet. I look different from them, and maybe nobody had even helped them with this amazing work of folding the bulletins. I insisted that I was going to be doing it, and they had no choice but to allow me. So this is how my ministry at St. Malachi uh, started. I started as somebody who was helping these white ladies fold the bulletin after Mass. I graduated into becoming an Eucharistic minister. I, I'm still lecturing. I'm still doing Eucharistic ministry. I've been helping with confirmation retreats. I got on parish council and I remember coming back home from burying my dad, Father O'Malley, who was then the pastor of my church, had given my name and I became a member of Cardinal Sean O'Malley's Agdiocesan Pastoral Council for eight years. People at my parish were so happy with the work that Boston College was doing with the children in Ghana during Lent, everybody stopped eating candy or buying something that was not too helpful for them. And we had Project Ghana, where we basically put money in that basket. And when we were getting ready to go to Ghana, we had enough money to buy food, enough money to buy school supplies, and other things that these children wanted. So I really became so connected with St. Malachi. And I'm going to end my St. Malachi story with it's a happy story. Easter Vigil, I was the reader of the story of creation. So for maybe 10, 12 years after all the candles were uh, put away and we started the reading, I did a Genesis story. You know, morning came and evening came and the story of creation. I don't know what happened, but one year, they actually moved me to do the second reading. And then at the end of the Easter Vigil, one of my friends, one of the ladies who were in my group of folding bulletins, came to me and said, I'm so sad. I'm like, oh my God, what happened, Mary? And she said, I came ready to hear you read the story of creation. And you didn't do it. I remember we, the two of us almost started crying. We hugged each other. And I just told her, they gave me something different. And I always try to do what people tell me to do. So this shows you, and this shows me, how participation, the way Sister Thea and other people have done it, brings us to our world for people to know that we are all children of God. If I had said no when the ladies didn't want me to be part of the folding of the bulletin club, I probably wouldn't have been able to show them that another person created by God was the same as everyone. The next story uh, happened when I went on my fourth trip with the Ignacio volunteers. So the Martin Luther King Scholarship Committee at Boston College sponsored me to go on these trips, which means I had to tell the children about Dr. King 
and how he wanted all of us to live as human beings. The other thing that is very good about this, these trips is my point about participation. When I first arrived in Belize, the students and the people at the camp were stunned in a very good way. They never knew there were black people at Boston College. So I think for the next 72 hours, I became the center of attraction at the camp. But what I did do every day that I was there for the week, I'll go from class to class and tell the children stories about Dr. King and how he wanted all of us to live together as human people. At the Dominic, in the Dominican Republic, I did the same thing that I usually will do. I'll pull next to me a white student from Boston College, stretch out my arm, stretch this student's arm, but I'll say, what's going to happen if I cut my skin and then I cut this other white person's skin? And all of them will say in unison, oh, the color of the blood will be red. It was great. I think that was the children's way of saying that we are all the same people. In the Dominican Republic, I repeated the same show, the same way, to get the children to be curious. And my last class for the day happened in a classroom where the children seemed to be very, very quiet. So we did our little black and white skin, cut our skin, what's going to be the color, for a whole 30 seconds, nobody said anything. And I think that as teachers, 30 seconds of silence in the classroom can be deadly. Luckily, one young man, seven or eight years old, said, I have an answer. And I said, what's the answer? And he said in Spanish, el alma no tiene color, which means the soul has no color. But then he said, I have another question. I think I want, I want to ask you a question. And he said this in Spanish. I'll say it in English. Is it true that in the United States, some white people think they are better than black people? So this was 22 years ago. This young man asked me one of the most profound questions anybody had asked me. And of course, I had to be very, very honest with him after telling them about Dr. King and his dreams. And I said, it is true. It is true. I'm not going to lie to you. But what do you think we should all do to be able to change this answer? And he said, from what you've told me and all my friends about Dr. King, I think we need to live as human beings. So the uh, bib biblical scripture that I use for this talk was based on that very simple Genesis 1 verse 27. We are all made in the image of God. 22 years ago, a young child in the Dominican Republic challenged me with this question. And I know this question is not 22 years old. It's almost 400 years old. And here we are in the United States where we don't believe that black people, especially, are human beings. It's a very painful thing to say, but we have to be very true to our Christian belief, tell the truth, and be very bold to tell the whole world. God made all of us as his children. And when somebody can put his knees on another person's neck to the point where this person loses his life, we know that we've lost it. So I'm just praying hard. I'm just appealing to everybody. Let's keep talking about the Black Lives Matter. It's very, very uncomfortable. I know sometimes when I talk to people, especially my white colleagues, about these issues, the first thing that they come up with is tell me how many black friends they have. I know 2020 is the census year. We are not talking about counting people. We all learned to count on Sesame Street. So let's all be bold. Let's all be very, very honest with ourselves. Let's come together as brothers and sisters and get into this fight to make sure that we can prove to people that God made all of us in his own image.